So today's lecture is um, dedicated to analyze these samples. And we're going to do two different types of analysis. We're going to do X-ray fluorescence for solid samples and ICP for liquid samples. We will show you how to analyze. Of course, you will not do it yourself and we will do that on your samples. But your assignment for the day is going to be to find material online that describe the principle of this analysis. I will briefly talk about the principle of analysis on the XRF, but we want you to find material that you don't have to create yourself that explains well how an XRF works for analyzing soils, how the ICP works, and in this case we do ICP OES, optical emission, um, works for analyzing samples, uh, and put that on your website. So the XRF um, instrument is that instrument. Yeah. This one is a portable XRF. There are versions that are more bulk, also a bit more precise, that um, can stand on their own, but you cannot bring them in the field. This one, you can bring it in the field. The general principle of an instrument like that is that it will uh, shoot X-rays at the sample. What the X-rays do is that they are going to excite the electrons that are surrounding the nucleus of the sample. If you remember the lecture at the beginning of the class about the properties of lead, we know that lead has a lot of electrons around, and um, that's a lot of electrons that we can excite. When we excite these electrons, they basically move out of state, not Vermont, uh, move, out, move out of their stable state, and electrons from higher orbitals, so electrons that are away more away from the nucleus, will move down to a lower orbital because the element needs to have its lower shell full. By doing so, a given electron will emit a very particular energy. And that's what we use when you do XRF. We're going to use specific energy of electrons lowering their orbitals um, to fingerprint basically what an element is. If we want to see that more precisely, we're going to look on the table like that. If we see lead here, we see three numbers. You recognize lead, okay, the atomic number, the mass, there are other elements there, and there's three small numbers that are right there, 74.989, 10.550, and 2.342, these are the energy levels of the three orbitals that are going to be emitted when we analyze, when we excite by X-ray um, this sample that contains lead. So if we find any peak, basically, of massive amounts of energy that is released at these particular values of kilo electrovolt, and I won't enter into details there, we know we have lead. Okay, so it's a, actually a very simple analysis, a very short analysis, and I will just start analyzing the five samples that we have. We're going to start with the composite sample. Here are my five samples. I'll put them on the prep. So we're going to load the sample so that we can use these vials and analyze for lead, lead content and concentration. I'm going to prepare the composite sample for the house that corresponds to the video two days ago, three days ago. So of course when we change sample location or sample container, it's very important to make sure that we record the name of the sample properly. SC, Nico, and the date, and we keep the date at which it was sampled. And it is our sample container and I will basically just transfer the sample into this new vial. Some of the key aspects when you transfer these samples is to make sure that you get all different grain size of the sample. Alright, and I don't need to put more than that amount of sample, basically the sample is covering all the way to there. X-rays will penetrate the samples only a few millimeters. And then we're gonna cover that sample with an X-ray transparent film, which is in there. 
<laughs> that is made of, and that's a proprietary term, mylar. It's some kind of plastic that we know is not disturbing the x-rays and is not adding any contamination to the x-rays. It's only made of carbon, which cannot be analyzed by x-ray fluorescence. And that allows us to revert the sample and have our sample that will be in contact with the X-ray when we put it on top of the machine. So now let's move on to the X-ray instrument itself. So this uh, X-ray gun is generating X-ray because there is an X-ray source there. There's a battery, an X-ray source, and it's connected to a computer, but you can disconnect it too. We put the sample in front of the gun and zoom there. And there is one part of this op opening there that will project the X-ray, and this part here on top is the detector. So basically, it will excite the sample, and whatever is emitted by the sample will bounce back into this detector. So we just put the sample on top of this opening so that we can analyze it. This is made of an element that you know know very well, which is lead. Because lead, as we know, is an extremely dense material with a lot of electrons, so it's actually gonna absorb the excess X-rays that are generated during the analysis. For safety purposes, of course, I will close the door. And then I will turn on the X-ray. <laughs> And here we go. It tells us that, of course, this unit is producing X-rays, so we need to be careful. So we can operate the XRF, XRF via the computer, um, or we could operate the XRF independently. We'll do it through the computer. It's just easier, more comfortable. So basically it tells us we can pull the trigger to start measuring, but of course the first thing to do is to make sure that we have the right sample name and we will want to change and make sure that we have the right parameters for analysis and that means that we're going to change the timing and we're going to measure for 60 seconds and we're also going to change and make sure that we have the right method. In our case, the method that we want is of course soils. And it's basically ready to operate now. So I can simply pull the trigger or when it's connected to the computer, press the space bar and it will measure for one minute. While the measurement is going, we start seeing some results and look at the lead. This is, remember, a composite sample. Two samples were far away from the house. Two samples were nearby the house and one sample was in between. So we represent somehow the concentration of lead in the general area of this property, my property. See? And it's very likely that some of these samples will be very high, some lower. But we are at a value of 766. It will change a little bit during the measurement. And I want to already throw in the mix there that EPA considers that any value that is above 400 for a soil is not suitable for a play area. I have a 10 years old kid, he grew up in this house, he knows extremely well that we cannot play in the dirt in, in, um, in the backyard unless we play far away from the property and we wash our hands extremely well. And here it's done. So our value is there. I will actually record the value manually. So our SC, Nico, 754 ppm plus or minus 6. Just for a test, uh, I'll just rerun the sample for generating X-ray and we will see if it generates X-ray uh, when we are analyzing. Spectrum? Yeah, that's what I wanted to show. So I found the only leakage was underneath. Okay. 
No. Uh, a tiny bit here. So that's good. This lead shield actually protects extremely well from radiation. We have made the analysis with using the Geiger counter. If we don't have the X-ray shield, um, by bypassing the security with the X-ray officers at university, the dose that would be arriving to a human being would be 20,000 times higher than what is allowed by, for safety. So let's look at one thing to finish there, and I will run the other samples independently. So this is the spectra that is generated during the analysis. And so the numbers we get are actually used, um, determined using a calibration. And that's basically the amount of energy that is coming out to the detector, and here a specific energy. And that's this energy that is emitted when the electrons are coming down one or two orbitals. Uh, after excitation and here we see some bumps right bumps that correspond to lead lead alpha and lead beta emissions that means that the third shell electrons have been going down to the second shell electron All right, so um, I'm here with Nico in the ICP lab in the Geology Building in Delahanty. Uh, we have two ICPs here. There's an older one that's uh, an Ultima uh, from the company JY, it's a French machine. And then we have a Kirk and Elmer that we acquired last year. This is a modern ICP, the JY is 20 years old. This is today's ICP, modern software, antique software running on Windows XP. Um, these machines are used in geology for two things. They're used to understand the concentration of elements in water, and they can do much, but not all, of the periodic table. So now we have the periodic table there. Um, and so very useful for looking at what's in groundwater, surface water, drinking water. Um, the beauty of ICPs is that many of them can make multiple element analyses on a single sample relatively quickly. So they're very useful for, for screening water samples. We also use them to understand what's in rocks. And we do that by digesting rocks in strong acid, and getting those rocks into a liquid solution. So most ICPs work on liquids. There are ICPs with lasers capable of working on solid materials. But here, we're going to be working entirely on liquids. So this laboratory, as we look around it, is set up to work in liquids. We have auto samplers and whole test tubes. We have a small fume hood for doing dilutions. We have a clean water source on the wall over there for making clean water that does not have many elements in it at all. So we use a series of cartridges to absorb anions and cations that are in those waters. And then we have various computers that collect data uh, about coming from each of these various machines. And, and when your samples come to us, uh, Nico will be responsible primarily for doing the XRF work that you'll see in the video, and I'm going to be responsible primarily for doing the ICP work. But we both do these, these kinds of work together, and these are fundamental ways with an XRF and an ICP of understanding the chemistry of waters and of solids like rocks that we have around us and soils. Okay, so this is the ICP, an inductively coupled plasma spectrometer. Um, it relies on a plasma that we haven't lit yet, um, and then a diffraction grating to take the light that's emitted from the samples as they're introduced into a plasma. Plasma is a really hot gas, is the best way to think about it. Um, that causes the electrons, just as Nico was explaining earlier in the uh, X-ray fluorescence, to change orbitals. Same thing happens here, but instead of X-ray is doing the excitation, it's this very hot gas. When those electrons cascade back down, um, they emit light of a particular wavelength, and that's what we analyze with this machine. Um, machine itself you're looking at, this is uh, about $60,000 right here. You can wrap your arms around it. Controlled by a computer here. Um, takes a couple feeds. This is the sample auto sampler. So your samples will go in here and that auto sampler will feed a little stream of liquid into here through a pump. That pump will come through here to something called an ultrasonic nebulizer. You can see that kind of white cloud of, of moisture. That's the sample right now. Um, and that will then be fed back into the machine and into the spectrometer. We require some other support for this. We require some gases. So this is our ICP laboratory uh, vestibule. We have two tanks of argon gas here. Um, and that's what we use to make that plasma. 
is this Argon gas. And we get about 12 hours of runtime off one of those tanks of gas here. We have all our standards for the machine down here. This is a vented cabinet, so any acid fumes that come off these go up that chimney pipe and we don't want to breathe them, which keeps us safe. And Nico and I are wearing our personal protective gear today because we're within six feet of each other, so we're trying to be safe. This is our ICP lab. Uh, we must wear goggles when we're mixing chemicals in here, or glasses. I've got my glasses on right now to protect my eyes. We have two ICPs. We have the big ICP, it's about 20 years old. Uh, very sensitive, good for running lots of elements at once, but a bit tricky because it's 20 years old. It's a little cranky. And then we have this new machine that we just got last year, which has much nicer software, much easier to use, and that's what we're going to be working on today. And we have this special nebulizer that allows us to decrease our detection limits to the point at which we can look for lead in water. So right now I'm going to try to start this uh, machine up. We've got to get the plasma started. And I'm going to go to plasma control here. And I'm going to turn the plasma on. This is about a 30 second operation. You uh, might be able to hear the gas flow. You'll hear uh, some ignition noises, some sparking. And then what you're going to see is a bright green plasma in there. It's probably green actually because there's a very thick piece of glass that's smoked in front of it. Um, staring at that plasma with your bare eyes would probably put an end to your vision on there. Uh, so we have that. Um, we have 26 seconds left to go here on the software. This is a pretty much automated machine. Uh, once we get it running, your samples will be lined up on those racks and they'll take about three or four minutes each and we'll get an analysis of how much lead uh, copper and chromium are in the samples that you sent. Um, today we're running uh, a couple samples from Nico's house. We expect those to be clean because Burlington water system is really clean for lead typically. Um, we have one sample from a water fountain in our geology building here. And those fountains have not been run for the better part of four months. And, and we've tested them before and they've been clean. But we're curious what happens when the water sits in the pipes for four months. And there's our plasma. Um, and your samples are going to be injected into that plasma. You can hear it. You can see it. Um, and that'll give us our analysis. Now, in order to understand how much lead is in your samples, we need to run standards. And Nico just poured out um, a set of standards. We will calibrate on four of those standards and we use a fifth one to check it. And those range from zero PPP lead in our blank uh, to 100 PPP lead, which you would not want to drink. And we're hoping that all of your samples come in below five. Um, we can reliably detect two or three uh, PPP of lead here in this lab. Um, but drinking water standards, we'd like to be non-detectable. We'd like to be less than a few PPP on there. So we'll see. Today we're going to calibrate with a blank, a 1, a 10, and a 100 PPP. Then we're going to run the blank, a 20, and a 5. Those should read PPP. I should go fix those. They're not correct. Um, and then we're going to run the blank again. So we're going to make sure that we get good analyses on things we know. Then we're going to run Nico samples, run the 5 again and the blank again, just to check. And then we'll run the fountain um, and come back, run the blank, and close with the rest of our standards. So we'll give this a shot, see if it works. I'm going to go to Analyze All, and we'll see what happens. This is the first time our machine has run since uh, March. Okay, so uh, we're making analyses now, and these are on standards. And this is the 10 part per billion standard. Uh, so that's not very much, and we can see the peak for chromium here uh, on the x-axis here is wavelength, and on the y-axis is the number of counts again, intensity, and we have some background points that we're going to subtract here, and there's the chrome peak. And in the 10 PPD standard, we get an intensity of about 74,000 counts for this chromium peak. For copper, we get about 65,000 counts, and for lead, we get about 5,000 counts, and again, that's 10 PPD. We're making three replicate measurements of each on here. So we've done the third replicate for chrome. Right now we're working on the third replicate for copper. And then we're going to do the third replicate for lead. So we always want to make repeat samples here. In the machine, you can hear the machine going back and forth. It takes a couple minutes to do each one of these. We now have our third replicate for copper. And we're waiting on our third replicate for lead. On this side we have a calibration. And the way the calibration works is we look at the intensity, the number of counts, versus the concentration of the element in our standards. And so far, we have just run the 0 and the 1 PPB. And of course, we have a perfect linear calibration because we only have two points to measure. Um, now, we're going to wait and see. As soon as we get that third lead replicate, this will recalculate, and we'll see our calibrations spread out. So 
Here's our chrome calibration with three. So there's our zero, or our blank. Here's our one PPB, and here's our 10 PPB. Here's the calibration for copper, and here's the calibration for lead, which looks really good today. So zero counts at zero intensities. And then here at uh, one PPB, we have higher intensity, and here at 10 PPB, we have even more.